Afternoon, everybody. We're going to give this, I guess, another uh, couple minutes till three o'clock just to make sure everybody gets in. And for the time being, everyone's going to stay muted as they come in. And there is a question pane that you can go ahead and send questions over um, as we're going through the presentation and go from there. So that's two more minutes and we'll get rolling here in about four minutes. All right, so we've hit three o'clock. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I know the chat window says, welcome to our third webinar, CIP behind the scene. Obviously from anyone looking at the screen right now knows that we're not talking about CIP. We're actually gonna be talking about ISA S88. Um, everyone will be put on mute for the duration of the presentation. There is a question window. So if anything pops into your mind that you wanna ask about, go ahead, throw a question in there and I'll go ahead and try to answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. So with further ado, uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to wherever you may happen to be. I'm Dave Bartlett. For those of you that haven't met or worked with me before, I'm the Senior Manager of Automation for No Deviation, and I'm finally back in Singapore after an 18-month hiatus. 
So today we're going to talk about ISA S88, which is a standard for automation that's not exclusive to pharma. S88 is not so much of a guideline as it is a framework for creating a batch automation system. So the standard itself doesn't actually provide any real how-tos on solving batch design issues, as we'll see in the following presentation. And my presentation will move. There we go. Sorry, I get two computers up since I can't have my notes and the presentation up simultaneously. So I've opted to make the presentation tech light. A lot of the people that uh, come to our ISP conferences and a lot of these meetings are more CQV and regulatory type, and S88 is an automation standard. Also, just to scare the regulatory people that might be on the line, S88 is a suggestion. It's not a regulation. So you can still have a regulatorily compliant system that's not S88 compliant, kind of like GE's unicorn system, which runs methods and is part 11 compliant, makes product, but it's not really S88 compliant. So in this presentation, we're gonna find out what ISA S88 standard is. And for those of you with three letter acronym overload, ISA is the International Society of Automation. So why did and why do we need a standard like this in the automation industry? And how does this help not just automation, but all disciplines? And finally, I'm gonna go into a tech light view of the S88 standard. Now terminology is there that we should all largely know, but not technology which is actually the core theme of the S88 standard. It's industry and platform agnostic. Oh, and uh, about the cookies, which probably everyone thought that they were going to get, that'll take about 10 minutes and 175 degrees or until golden brown later in the presentation. So what is S88? It's shorthand for ANSI ISA S88, which is a standard for organizing process control elements, and it's primarily designed for batch processes. It's a design philosophy for describing equipment and procedures. It is not a standard for software like IEC 61131, which is something that you see, you know, when you open a control module like function blocks or structure text or ladder logic. All the smaller components in the system, you'll typically see one of us automation engineers pouring over. It's equally applicable to manual processes, but obviously they're not going to have the procedural module component. It started up in 1988, hence the S88 part. It was approved by the ISA Working Group in 1995 and updated in 2010. It's industry non-specific, so it doesn't matter if you're pharmaceutical, oil and gas, chemical, food, whatever. S88 provides a consistent set of standards and terminology for batch control. It defines a physical model and a procedural model, as we have at the V at the bottom there. <clears throat> The physical and procedural model are the parts we're gonna talk about today, but actually S88 has four separate parts. Part one is the models and terminology. Part two are the data structures and guidelines for languages. Part three is general and site recipe models and part four are batch production records. CQV teams and regulatory teams online might be interested in hearing on that one at another time. But for today, we're just going to cover part one since the information in all four parts is actually quite dense. So why do we need a standard? It seems like the automation systems from all the major players back in the day were doing just fine cranking out products across all the industries for decades. We had a steady supply of medicine, we had petrol for our cars. Why do we need this? ISA is a working group across all industries. If you look and see who actually signed off on S88, it's people from oil and gas, chemical, pharmaceutical, automation vendors like Fisher Rosemount as they were known back in the day, Siemens, Honeywell, and even equipment vendors like Mettler Toledo. Everyone realized that they were often talking about the same thing, but were using very different terms and methodologies. So they saw a couple issues. One, vendors, controls, and processes were very potato, potato. Two teams trying to get to the same result, but didn't have a common working language. Programming new batch code was really hard and expensive, even for derivative products within the same site. And automation engineers, were outrageously expensive. On top of that, they weren't really portable across industries or even companies in some cases because of this potato, potato localized knowledge and language. And trying to integrate different parts and pieces together and make sure that they talked was really a free for all. And the main four issues on the screen are the basic issues that S88 meant to resolve. And we're gonna to touch on each one here in a moment. I know it's kind of an information dense slide. So issue one, define terminology specific to batch control systems that will encourage understanding between manufacturers and users. So S88, the group got together and said, okay, 
from today forward, this is what a control module is, this is what an operation is, full stop. And it doesn't matter whether you're running Delta V or PCS7, or if you make petrol or pharmaceuticals, there is a standard terminology across vendors and industries and engineering terms. No more potato, potato. I am just potato. Issue two and three are kind of similar. Provide a standard data structure batch control language to simplify the programming, configuration tasks, and communication between the various components of the system. Provide a standard data structure for batch systems that will simplify the task of data communications within the system architecture. So how did it do this? It broke a holistic concept up into three parts, a procedural model, a physical model, and a process model. This decoupling separated what the equipment was supposed to be doing, the procedural model, from the equipment itself, the physical model, and what the product was doing, the process model. So for example, an oven is just an oven. It's equipment that is product and process agnostic. You can use it to make cookies or a cake. You can use it for art projects, or you can use it to dry clothes. And for the love of the SCDF, please do not try to do that. Because of the sectional nature and repeatability prescribed by S88, it made it a lot easier for process teams to talk to control teams. Hey, just repeat that agitate phase again, but set the agitator to run at 150 instead. S88 decoupled the process model from the procedural model and the physical control, which also effectively decoupled specific process parameters as well. So CPPs were not equipment specific. They were everything. So because of this, S88 encouraged also something called class-based design for modern automation systems. And class-based, if you haven't heard us use the term before, is a concept where you build one, validate one, and repeat ad infinitum, which we call instantiating. It's kind of the same idea of subroutines and programming languages like Visual Basic. You build it once and use it again and again. And this works really well with the decoupled structured nature inside of S88. This also meant that brand new recipes could be built from scratch without complete revalidation, as you were basically just reusing existing building blocks to do so. Now, you still have to do something like a PQ, and you still have to run the process and make sure that it works correctly but the underlying code itself wouldn't really require any new revalidation. It's the same code you've been using. And compared to the dark ages, and I'm looking at some of the early versions of Emerson DCSs, the code would likely have to be completely revalidated and revetted because every instance and every run of that recipe was unique. Issue four. Provide a standard data structure for batch systems that will simplify the task of data communications within the system architecture. So first off, don't get me wrong, integrating disparate systems is still plenty painful. It's gotten a lot easier in the last decade plus that I've been doing this kind of work, but that's another discussion for another day. But S88 does define a state table on how a batch should move from something like idle to running to stop. And while it's still kind of a pain to couple two vendor systems together, we can issue batch commands to the subordinate system and tell it to do something like start media prep on this vessel and make a thousand kilograms. And because of this standardized terminology, we know when to start it, when to stop it, what's running. We know if there's an issue with the batch that's running and we can use common terms and common terminology to synchronize the two systems. So in part one of the S88 uh, standard, it talks about the physical and the procedural model. The physical model is just that. It's the things you can touch and are used to make the product. I have somebody, let's see, Mr. Jimmy here. Okay, change on result. So the physical model is just that. It's the things you need to make a product. The procedural model is a little more abstract. It's the code that tells the equipment to do things like heat up, mix, etc. It's not the part maintaining a set point. It's the code that's effectively emulating a human's interaction with the control system and the physical equipment based on where the product and process is in the production timeline. So I mentioned cookies, and this is how we get into the part about cookies and how it relates to S88. So in the S88 physical model, the top three units in the hierarchy, enterprise, site, and process area, are actually technically not part of S88 and its definition of interactions. S88 starts at the process cell level, but to be honest, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense just to have a bunch of process cells lying about without some level of organization. It's like leaving your files all over the desktop. 
Also, these three levels get into another standard, which is called S95, which deals with more things like ERP systems. So SAP or Maximo and MES systems like Wareham or Syncate. And again, that's another topic for another time if anyone shows interest. So the highest level of organizational structure is the enterprise or company. Our example for the rest of this is going to be one of the most common cookie companies you see in Singapore malls, which is Famous Amos. So an enterprise has sites. And if they don't have sites, I suppose S88 really doesn't apply to them because they're not making anything. And a site is a physical location. And in a lot of cases, site equals manufacturing, building, or suite, not just the physical address. A lot of places around here, definitely in Tuas and Pioneer, there's multiple you know, manufacturing suites and lines. And it's just one quote unquote site from a physical address, but from an S88 hierarchy and organization, it would be multiple sites. And a site is comprised of one or more process areas. So for example, when I was writing this and, and I was in uh, quarantine, first thing that came to mind was uh, Wisma across the street. And so the famous Amos site in Wisma to basically take a cookie shop and turn it into terms more familiar to us and a whole lot less fun, they have a kitchen slash production area, a packaging area, and a product hold area. And an area is made up of one or more process cells. And a process cell is meant to be a full complement of equipment that performs one major process task. So in this case, the kitchen area has process cells for things like mixing, material prep, and baking, also known as a stand mixer, a table, and an oven and a stove. And so each process cell has one or more units. So the baking process cell has the oven and the stove, and the mixing process cell has just the mixer. And units are made up of one or more equipment modules or control modules. Now, S88 does allow for a unit to contain only control modules. So the stove unit contains two equipment modules, the burners and the broiler, or the oven, depending on how it's set up. And an equipment module is made up of one or more control modules. And in some cases, it's also made up of more equipment modules and control modules, and kind of like a recursive Matryoshka doll of control. Equipment modules that run other equipment modules as a replacement for the procedural model is typically decisively referred to as poor man's batch by automation engineers. And most equipment modules have some sequencing capability, which is the reason that people do this, and full batch systems are admittedly expensive. But a poor man's batch system is not S88 compliant, the equipment module is effectively handling tasks meant for some of the procedural model elements, like a phase or even an operation. But this poor man's batch style, while it's not S88 compliant, it can still be regulatorily compliant. Not to mention building a system like this in this day and age is going to be a pain to maintain with you know, newer automation engineers. It's also going to be a real pain to justify doing it this way to a regulator if you decided to build it with a newer system like PCS7 or Delta V. But it still exists, it's still done frequently for um, a number of other industries and for systems that are just starting out. And it's very frequently found inside of laboratory systems that run major control systems like PCS7 or Delta V. And the smallest nuclear unit in S88 is a control module. And control modules can contain more control modules, that's permitted, but they're not supposed to contain equipment modules. And so for this example, the single temperature control loop for the left burner would be our control module, just like you'd have a control module for you know, vessel control or a singular vat. But then you go and you're scratching your head, you say, now hold on, Dave, I've seen what the control engineers work on and there's stuff inside those control modules or equipment modules. CMs aren't the smallest thing in the system. And what you're referring to is the control algorithm, which is the guts of the control module. And it's true, there's code inside the control module and it wouldn't work otherwise, right? But the control module is meant to represent the smallest discrete function in the unit. So a valve, an indicator, a temperature control loop. So CMs, and in a lot of cases, EMs, will and can contain all the different flavors of that 611.31 standard that I mentioned earlier 
in the presentation, which is a standard for process programming languages. And a lot of them are even a mix of multiple programming languages. But SADA only looks at the CM as a whole. It doesn't actually go inside and look at all the little blocks inside of it that make a valve open or make it maintain dissolved oxygen or maintain temperature. It doesn't really care about that. It only looks at just the CM. And parts of SADA, uh, interestingly, do discuss things like interlocking, but intentionally, it doesn't explicitly say how to do interlocking. It doesn't say why you should do interlocking. It just kind of says how it should work. And it doesn't explicitly say what control languages should be written in either. It just says it should have it or should be able to do this. So there's, yes, there's parts inside of the control module, but SADA really does not care what the innards of those control modules look like. So that's the physical model. That's the things you can touch and is going to impact the problem. So we're going to talk about the other half of S88, which is the procedural model. And the procedural model is basically sequencing. Do X, then Y, then Z to make product A. And procedures are the top level of the hierarchy and are made up of unit procedures. Unit procedures are made up of operations. Unit procedures down are only intended to be run on a single process cell or unit. And only one unit procedure is meant to run on a unit at one time. I know a lot of modern DCSs will kind of get around that, but that's just based on what the definition from S88 of what a unit procedure is, which we'll get into on a couple of slides. Operations are made up of phases, and just like control modules are the smallest nuclear unit for the physical model, phases are the smallest nuclear unit of the procedural model, and they are supposed to be the interface between the physical and procedural models. So like I said, the smallest nuclear unit for the procedural model is the phase. For the S88 definition, it's supposed to be the smallest repeatable action to be done by the equipment in a single unit. So something like manipulate an agitator, fill the tank with water, and actions like that. A phase can operate multiple pieces of equipment at the same time, like when it's running a CIP sequence. You know, spray balls, agitator, bottom valves, et cetera. So it's a lot of different EMs and pieces of equipment running simultaneously, but it's not really meant to cross unit boundaries. And as a side note, I've seen really bad implementations of this where people build massive phases to do far too much and they act a lot like unit procedures. So instead of breaking things into smaller discrete units, it's just one massive thing going on. Uh, one other thing I wanna talk about is, you know. S88 says it's the smallest repeatable action to be done by the equipment in a single unit. There is another standard uh, by Nomor called NE33, which is similar to S88. It's the German batch standard versus the American and international batch standard, even though most of Europe kind of adheres to S88. Uh, PCS7 and some German style of coding will typically see something more of NE33, where you'll see a whole lot of phases in an operation um, running individual EMs instead of one phase trying to manipulate a number of EMs. It just has to do with their definition of what a phase is and how it is supposed to interact with the system. Personally, I kind of like NE33 for most tasks because it's more modular and trying to do things like NPIs move a lot quicker. Uh, but for stuff like CIP or depending on, it's, it's very task oriented, which one, you know, is kind of better to follow and you know, ends justify the mean sort of thing there with that. And also with the phases, I mean, this is where modularity and decoupling of S88 comes into play. You know, a cookie making process requires us to heat up and eventually turn off an oven. And the oven has temperature control on it, or at least I hope it does. We aren't changing the target equipment. We're not using a different oven. We're not using a different uh, control module and we're not changing how to control it. It's consistent throughout the process, but the intended outcome from the use of the equipment changes. This is process versus physical versus procedural models. It's a different outcome with the same equipment, but in a different step of the process. And because of the physical and process bottle decoupling, so phases like measure, mix, set temperature, weight, you can create them once and repeat them as needed across different units and operations as long as the other units have the same equipment required by the phase, like a weigh scale or some kind of temperature control. So an operation is a repeatable series of phases. 
And an operation is defined as an activity that has significant impact on the product or process. So like phases, operations aren't intended to manipulate equipment across process cells or units. So for example, the prepare of an operation is the same operation, but with different set points. Like I mentioned earlier, you kind of divorce CPPs and other parts out because of this you know, separation of the three models that are there. This creates a significant change in the process by effectively changing the equipment state. And because of SADA's decoupling of physical process procedural models, this can actually be identical code. You're just running it with you know, a different set point. And a unit procedure is a repeatable series of operations. And the unit procedures are defined to be major processing activities that mark a defined end to product processing. So something like baking. Also like phases and operations, unit procedures were not intended to manipulate equipment across process cells or units, and they're the largest object in the hierarchy meant to be run on a single unit. So basically heat up the oven, put in the cookie tray, wait till ready, remove and wait again. That's a major processing activity because you've taken the raw material and created the final cookies, which is a major part of the process. Now, mom would have her heads if we didn't clean up the oven. So that's another major part of the overall process. And again, a different unit procedure. But both actions are performed on the oven, but they're separate, discrete parts of the whole activity. And then finally, there's the procedure. And the procedure is the top level of the recipe or the batch, and it's meant to involve multiple units and unit procedures. So if you run it from left to right, the secret cookie recipe procedure requires the mixing unit to do the dough makeup, a major change in the product from the raw materials to dough. And I know plenty of people that would stop right after the dough prep and call it a day and just eat raw cookie dough. But the oven needs to be preheated and then the cookie dough needs to be put in the oven. Baking is a major change in the product from the raw dough to gooey warm cookies. That entails both heating up the oven and cooking them. But then finally, the oven needs to be turned off marking a major change in the equipment as part of the cleanup unit procedure on the oven. So just a little recipe like this, you've got two units, the oven and the mixer, you have three unit procedures, prep, baking, and cleanup, three operations, dough prep, oven prep, which you use twice, and cooking, and eight phases, one of which is used through multiple units and multiple times to make cookies. And because of the process actions, the procedural model is separate from the process of making cookies. These components and equipment can be reused for other activities that the equipment is capable of, basically by only changing the set points or the order of operations. We don't have to create entirely new code from the ground up when we decide that we want to make something like a cake. It's the same code, it's the same equipment, but just from a little bit of restructuring, instead of having to rewrite all of this like we did prior to S88 with all the different control system ways of doing it, just some restructuring allows us to real quickly move from one product to another or one procedure to another um, pretty simply. Oh, too far. So finally, I hope that the presentation was informative um, about some of the basic parts of S88. I mentioned that this only covers the first of four parts of the standard, and if there's interest on feedback, we can go into some of the other ones or go into NE33 or S95, which I've mentioned earlier. And S88 is a standard we use consistently. We don't really think about it, uh, especially if you're not in automation and not aware of it, but we also don't realize how much it's helped in discussions between different functional teams, you know, between QA, between regulatory, between the process engineers, the automation engineers, and manufacturing, all this goes together, and we all seem to be talking about control modules and equipment modules and where a lot of this base terminology came from. And having been an automation engineer for well over a decade and worked not only in pharma, but in some of the other industries like oil and gas and chemical, it, those terms of being able to say control module or equipment module or loop or anything like that, whether I'm talking to somebody at Conoco or BP or Dow, or Merck or Abvi and everyone understanding the same language is quite invaluable. And also S88 is ultimately a standard. It's not a regulation. 
you could, in theory, throw S88 out the window in designing a control system, which would still meet process and regulatory requirements. I wouldn't recommend it in any way, shape, or form, but in theory, it can be done. And S88, as I mentioned in the previous slide, when we were talking about procedures, it's really helped with MPIs and extending the use of existing equipment because of it decoupling the process, the equipment actions, and the equipment itself, and speeding up the time it takes to go from process concept into making product. And I'm hoping that wherever you go from now on and you happen to walk past a famous Amos, you'll start referring to the glass display case as product hold. And so while I've been informed that this was a BYOC presentation, bring your own cookie. I don't believe I have any cookies in the house, so I'm going to have to settle for very juicy, uh, good questions instead. And we'll go ahead and open um, microphones and also see if anyone's typed any questions in, which doesn't quite look like. So go ahead if there's any questions or anything else, and we'll unmute everybody so they can ask questions, or I'll try. Unmute. I think everything's unmuted if anybody had any questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap up around uh, 3.30. All right, well, if they're, nope, oh, I'm getting a message. Maybe we got something not set up right. Cannot unmute attendees, weird. So if anyone has any questions, they're gonna have to type them in the question window that comes up. Okay, I was informed that you have to unmute yourself. So you want to go ahead, hit the unmute button if you got any questions. Um, hey, Dave. Dave. Hey, whoa, lots of people. Wow. Okay, there we go. We can unmute ourselves. Uh, just ask the question can you share some experience on DCS for single use facility? Sure. Um, Actually, it was interesting. The, the project that I just came off of was a hybrid facility. So the first part, uh, basically N minus three down until it hit production was single use. And once it hit production, production was still stainless. Um, the interesting thing is, and part of the, I guess, power that you, know, you see with single use is it's basically eliminating the CIP and SIP routine. So you just get a, a bag, you know, there's a procedure to bring it into the, the exoskeleton that you inflate the bag into and then fill and just run your process in there. For the most part, um, I can't speak too much to some of the, the MSET like tech transfers going from a stainless vessel in terms of like mixing studies and uh, KLAs and, and parts like that. But to be honest, it's the same. There really does not appear to be too much difference between whether you're using a stainless vessel or you're using the plastic bag in order to, to make the product. Obviously there's some you know, physical needs that are different. You have to be a little bit more gentle with the, uh, the plastic bags. You're not using SIP, you're not doing CIP, but for the most part in terms of control, it's effectively identical. The instrumentation is the same. The underlying code can remain the same. And even in a lot of what we were doing uh, for the past year and a half, it was identical code that was being run 
in stainless steel reactors. So I think that the, the best part of you know, using single use, one reduction in chemicals and other utilities that are there, um, the speed at which you can get the plant up and running because you don't need all that in there, you don't need to do all that validation, you're validating your and qualifying your uh, supplier of bags and your procedure to you know, prep the bags for use. Um, it's definitely worthwhile and definitely worth a look and effectively going for an ROI comparison between the two. Cool, thanks. So if I have a, a wave director supplier and they have their own PLC, how do I integrate that into my overall P PCS? Uh, it depends on the wave bioreactor and whose make and model it is. So the ones that we used were GE. They actually do pure Ethernet IP and they can be treated just like a motor effectively. You just send set points to them, tell them what to do um and feed it back and forth we actually part of what i did was take it from just a very dumb piece of equipment to a rather intelligent piece of equipment and using a protocol that's the same one that we use to talk to things like uh, bfds so that's one option another one is it, it depending on who makes it i think uh something like a an eppendorf um, I think they only talk like a, a Modbus protocol, which restricts what can be done on the system to an extent. Um, but it, it really comes down to what are the needs of the process and how in-depth control do they need on the wave bioreactor. So some of them I've seen people just use a unicorn laptop set set points. You know, I follow the procedure, sign off on the logbook and call it a day. And we've other things where we've built entire batch control around manipulating the, the bioreactors. And I hate to say it's case by case, but we can talk about it separately. Sure. What about the CMs? Are they different on the disposables? And there's, I don't know, they're disposable hey, well, expenses? Yeah. So if we're talking about waves, yes, they're, they're a little bit different. Um, the internals of the CM for a wave bioreactor, especially if the control is going to be at the PLC and not so much in the DCS, then you're effectively just going to have a dummy block that's going to replicate a lot of the features of, say, let's say it's a temperature control. So you'll have kind of a, a dummy PID block in there that pretends to do temperature control, but really just hands the set point and the information off to the PLC. Whereas if you're doing temperature control on a actual bag that doesn't have a PLC and just has um, you know, temperature controller out there and some sort of a heating jacket or heating element on there, the CM really doesn't look any different from what you would have in a stainless vessel. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, so Dave asks, could you please explain again the difference between the physical model and the procedural model? Sure or not because my keyboard doesn't want to go up. All right, so I can see. So physical model is exactly that. It's physical. It's the things you can touch um, and see in the facility. So it's the, the actual equipment itself. So valves, actuators, agitators, um, temperature control, all that kind of stuff. It's the actual eliciting a, a response from the equipment itself. That is the physical model, telling it what to do. Not just saying, you know, this control module opens and closes a valve, but telling it that that valve should be open at this point in time, which is something that would effectively be changing set points based on what the process or product is doing that would be the procedural model. So your recipes, the parts of the system that should emulate human interface and interaction with control modules or equipment modules, that would be the procedural model. It's not uh, actually in controlling a end element, it's informing the CM to take action on it. So it's, you know, if there was a, I guess the best example of it is if you had a paper batch record and it said, you know, go over and open this quarter turn valve by hand or open this mushroom valve by hand. That would be your procedural model. Whereas the phase writing to a control module and saying, you valve 101, go to open, 
is effectively the same thing, but the valve 101, which is triggering a solenoid and making sure that the valve actually opens or closes as commanded, which would be part of the control module, that is the physical model. I know it's, it's kind of funky because it's code at the end of the day. You know, a, a CM is code, a phase is code, everything all the way up from that, you know, up until effectively the, the site uh, in a lot of DCS design, it's code. There's, there's nothing really physical out there other than the IO. And that's kind of where the, the breakdown kind of is, is odd because you're still looking at a control module. It's still blocks on screen or ladder logic. But that's where the physical difference is, is that the procedural model is something that is based on what the process should be doing or what the equipment should be doing, not the actual representation of the equipment itself. Does that uh, make sense, Dave? Maybe send in the chat or unmute yourself. Cool. All right. Uh, and I'm going to basically kind of ask the similar question to what Chen Chen had about does automation play a big part in a single use system? Absolutely. Um, they, they, well, that's, that's kind of a silly question. That, I'm not saying that, or silly answer rather, because yes, automation is always going to play a major part in any of the systems. It just has to do more with how do the systems tie together. So like I said, a, let's take a, a bioreactor. And I'm not going to tell you whether it's single use or stainless. You know, you have vessel temperature control, you have jacket temperature control, you have DO, you have pH, you have agitation. You basically have an inlet and an outlet. Um, you might have some other controls on there that you're interested in, say like a uh, metabolite or feedstock or um, any foam control. And they can be done through all kinds of different sensors, you know, pH probes, DO probes, ramen, uh, capacitance, you know, the toroidal sensors, um, a number of different ways to do this. And it's still going to be the same style of writing for CMs, whether that pH control loop was going to be on a single use plastic bag or it's going to be in stainless. Now, if, as Shen Shen mentioned, you're trying to interface two systems together, so for example, you're doing like a GE uh, bioreactor or wave bioreactor, like I think it's the Accelerix, which they use, um, uh, I think it's Somatic or the Siemens PLCs for, then how it looks on the DCS from the control module and how that control module looks is going to be quite a bit different than if it was pure instrumentation going directly back to the DCS. But that would be like anything. If you're trying to run, say, um, an autoclave or a glass washer through a DCS, all that stuff is you know, prepackaged. You, you have an HMI on the skid that's out there. You tell it, hey, I want to run this. So you're not always going to have the same information or same types of information. You're going to sort of cherry pick what you bring back into the DCS. Typically, your CPPs or other information needs to come back. And you're not going to have the same type of modules and everything that are there. And it's not really going to look the same. And I guess we could uh, we talk about that separately. I don't know if you guys are looking at the same thing or the same system. Or uh, we can all have that, that conversation with the rest of the ND folks at one point. We can get into that deeper. So I don't know if anyone has any other questions. It's starting to thunder and lightning here, so I don't know how stable my uh, connection is going to be after that. Um, if there were any others, I think we can forward them back to uh, Pierre or the ND team or myself, um, and we'll try to answer them. And I believe, I think Shen Shen or Pierre could answer that. The presentation will be available later once the recording processes and we have a link for it. And I've also been asked to send the slides out, which I will once I take off uh, my notes and clean them up a little bit. Yeah, so to, to that point, Dave, um, if you receive the email, after the webinar, you will receive an email and then there is a no deviation channel where you can find all our webinar. So if you don't know how to access it, just hop us an email and we'll send you the link. Okay. I think if it's the same like the last one, uh, like we did for ISP, then I'll go ahead, pull it down and upload the, the video like we did last time. 
No, it's automatically on the go to webinar. So we have um, now we have a um, go to stage channel, and it gets uh, one or two days after the webinar we upload, uh, and then you can find the, the the CIP and the cleaning validation webinar, and we'll put this one at the okay. same location. Sounds good. Thank you, Dave, and welcome back, Aaron. Yeah, good to be back. I'll see you guys soon. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye.